Hello, everyone. Uh, just a quick sound check. Uh, are you able to hear me? Can someone confirm? Uh, Zach, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So we'll get started today. Um, thank you for joining us for this media briefing about COVID-19 vaccine in Idaho. My name is Zachary Clark and I am moderating the briefing today. Before we get started, I want to let you know that we are providing ASL interpreters for these briefings. You can hover over the three little dots to the right in their video window to lock the screen in place. Click on the layout options in the upper right corner, then click on full screen. When the full screen appears, a floating window of the panelists will show. Find the video labeled ASL interpreter. You can increase the video size by clicking and expanding. <clears throat> so uh, Governor Brad Little will start us off today and then he'll have to leave the briefing for another appointment. We'll also hear from Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson and Public Health Administrator Elke Shah Tolik before we open it up for vaccine related questions from media participants. Dr. Christine Hahn, State Epidemiologist, and Sarah Leeds, Idaho Immunization Program Manager, also will participate in the briefing. We will not be taking questions from the public at this time. Please note that everyone should be muted unless they are speaking. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Little. Hey, Governor, you're still muted there. Oh, you muted. Uh, Zach, you mu uh, muted me. You should be unmuted now. Okay. All right. A lot of people want to mute me, so I understand that. Uh, well, first off, a, a little bit of an update. Uh, this morning, we looked at our case count, and we have, this is an amazing number, 88% of our counties have a case count of under 25 on a rolling average, which is just uh, literally amazing compared to where we were. Uh, there was a call. Uh, a national governor's call this morning. I was a little late to it. I had another meeting. Uh, there is a little increase in, in vaccine and uh, perhaps Elke or Dave know, knows what that, uh, what that is. Uh, we got some other updates, but really today what we want to talk about is our, the new data tool that, that we rolled out that's a result of the executive order on, on transparency that we issued on the 28th of January. We, we want to get this data out uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, for, the, uh, for your sake, and also that the people of Idaho uh, know where the vaccine is and how it's available. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, states are having the same issues we are in Idaho, some of the federal pharmacy programs, how we do that, trying to get all the systems uh, talking together, the pharmacies talking with Tiberius, talking with Iris, our system here, uh, but uh, Dave and Elke will explain that. But our goal is a fair, safe, uh, rapid and transparent administration of the vaccine. Uh, the National Guard is doing great work in helping all around the state. And I've just uh, had a visit with uh, General Garshak a little bit ago, and we have some more guard that we're gonna make available uh, to work all over the state under my executive authority. A, a executive order authority uh, that will help with administration to where we're trying to address the uh, the weak links and help get the uh, vaccine out. And we also, uh, the grants that we announced earlier uh, that made them available to everyone uh, to try and minimize any kind of a possible resource barrier, uh, whether it's somebody new that's administering vaccine or people that have been in hospitals and pharmacies that have been administering vaccine for a very long time. Of course, like all the other states, demand uh, outpaces supply. Uh, we, we have found some of the vaccine uh, because of accounting issues that were out there. We're making that available, uh, but we will continue and I will continue to press the Biden administration on uh, what we consider to be Idaho's fair share uh, two of the headwinds we have there is in a fast growing population, some of the some of the census data is either old or it's detected in a different way. And second is we have the second or third highest percent of people under 18. And both of those are a little bit of headwinds, but uh, we'll continue to refine the data, have a dialogue 
uh, with, uh, I, I don't even know if they call it Operation Warp Speed anymore, uh, but General Perna and the administration on what we can do to get more vaccine. But in the meantime, uh, Dave and Elke will talk about our new data dashboard and what we're doing to offer that transparency all over the state. So, Zach, thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate your time today. And I will jump in today with uh, some additional comments here. Uh, as of uh, Sunday, there were 407 enrolled COVID-19 vaccine provider locations across the state with 46 more provider locations in process. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, and these numbers are on our websites, we um, had 189,042 doses that have been administered and 151,939 people who have received the vaccine. Uh, and we're starting to reach a point now where the number of doses administered is now higher than the number of cases that we've had in the state. Uh, and looking forward to these those numbers increasing. As of yesterday, Idaho had received about 266,000 doses and it, as mentioned earlier, administered about 189,000 of them, which means that 71% of these doses that have been received by Idaho have been administered. If I break that down just a little further, as of today, 91%, I'll say that again, 91% of first doses received in Idaho have been administered, uh, which means there's less than one week's worth of inventory in the state right now. Um, so we are doing, the providers are doing a great job of getting those first doses out within, a, within seven days, which is our goal. Uh, second doses arrive uh, about a week or more ahead of when they're scheduled to be given. As of today, 41%, I'll say that again, 41% of second doses have been administered. Uh, in looking at the data, it appears that the vast majority of individuals are getting their second dose right on time. Uh, so this means that second doses are occurring at the rate that we would expect at this point. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about the Federal Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care uh, Facilities and mentioned that we had reallocated some doses from CVS back to the state. Uh, this, this past week, we also uh, reallocated doses from Walgreens and what we reallocated was 6,825 first doses along with 6,825 second doses and that's from Walgreens back to the state. Uh, those actions have already taken place. Uh, most of the first doses arrived in Idaho on Monday and the rest will arrive by Thursday, and those were uh, distributed throughout the state. Uh, second doses obviously will follow in a couple of weeks, and so uh, in total we've uh, reallocated about 13,600 doses from Walgreens back to the state, and that was from the, uh, again, the Federal Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Facilities. Um, I'm going to talk for a minute now about the new transparency website, and I'm going to share my screen here, um, and I'm going to look to make sure that that's happened. So I believe that, okay, yep, my, it's being shared now. Um, and this is our dashboard that you're familiar with on coronavirus.idaho.gov. And uh, you'll notice we have our uh, normal statistics of doses administered as well as people here at the top. Uh, and you'll notice we have two buttons now here above that. One is vaccine administration transparency data. That's the new data that was just published yesterday. And the other is the COVID vaccine data dashboard. And I just wanted to take a second and explain why we have that as two buttons. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine data dashboard has been out since the beginning of the vaccination process. And that is really focused on people, uh, number of people that have been vaccinated, how many have first and second doses, how that plays out across counties, et cetera. Uh, where this new data is actually around providers or back enrolled COVID-19 vaccine providers. Um, and the reason that we do that separately is it, they could look different. And let me give you an example to explain that. If you have someone who lives in Nampa, uh, who travels to a facility in uh, Ada County uh, to get their vaccine shot, the way that would show up is on the people dashboard, that person would be counted as somebody in Nampa. So in uh, Canyon County in public health district three as having gotten a first dose. However, since they got their first dose in Ada County, if that was the case, uh, then on our provider data, that would show up as a dose administered by that provider in Ada County in Public Health District 4. Uh, and so we're tracking people with one dashboard, uh, the other dashboard, the other data we're tracking providers. 
Um, with that, I just want to flip over to the uh, provider dashboard here. Uh, and this is our live data. Um, I, hopefully many of you have already seen that already. Uh, we show a map of the states, which has by public health district, the total number of doses that have been administered by public health district. Uh, over here, you can see the state summary of doses received, doses administered, and how, what percentage of uh, that doses received has been administered. Uh, at the provider level, um, this is total first and second doses. I just wanted to mention that to make sure that that is clear. Um, and in addition, um, this uh, the data is going to be updated at least initially on Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, until we get our processes ironed out. So probably in about a week or two, we'll move to daily updates. But for now, it will be updated on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, you can see on this box here, uh, all of the um, health districts, oops, sorry about that, all of the health districts uh, laying out their specific numbers. Um, if you hover over the bar, it gives you the breakdown of total doses administered in the percentage. Um, that goes through each of the health districts. We've also included the federal pharmacies. That's federal pharmacies for the long-term care program. Uh, and you can see the doses they've been allocated um, as well as the administration rate for that. I just wanted to mention that this federal pharmacies uh, no longer includes the doses that we've reallocated back to Idaho. So again, we've reallocated about 12,600 from CVS back to Idaho. Those have already been distributed in Idaho and about 13,600 from Wal Walgreens. Uh, and so those are not included in these numbers here. Um, same thing on the public health districts. You can hover over the public health district and it'll give you the summary of doses administered and percent administered. Um, and then the providers are located down here on the bottom of the screen. Um, and with, uh, uh, with, if you click on any specific public health district, if I click on uh, public South Central Public Health District, that will highlight the health district over here and then bring up the individual providers uh, for that specific health district. And again, give you the information of doses received and doses administered. Uh, these are listed in order of number of doses that have been allocated to each healthcare provider. Um, so that's a little bit about the, the vaccine dashboard here. Um, and we hope you find that information to be useful. Um, and so we, we know that providers in particular will potentially have questions. Uh, we have set up an inbox for them and uh, what we're calling office hours for them to reach out to uh, make sure we have the data correct uh, from their perspective. There can be up to 72 hours delay in getting the data from IRIS, which is our system onto the dashboard. Uh, and we'll continue to work with providers to make sure that the, uh, all the data is as most accurate it can be. Again, this is data based on providers. Um, and then the other dashboard, which you've all seen for a couple of weeks now, is data based on people. Um, and that's the difference between the two, because uh, again, it depends on where the person lives for where they get counted here uh, on the provider is where the dose was administered. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just share with you that uh, on February 1st, those 65 and older became eligible for the vaccine. As of today, approximately 16,000, or excuse me, as of today, approximately 62,500 individuals over 65 have received a first dose. Um, again, that's 62,500 individuals over 65 have received a first dose. There are roughly 291,000 people in Idaho who are 65 and older. That includes those that reside in long-term care centers. Um, obviously they were in phase one and then there's about 200 of that, about 265,000 that are here in phase two. Uh, but if you do that math, that means about 21% of those 65 and older have now had a first dose. Um, we do wanna remind um, both those 65 older and the general public that we're receiving about 25,000 first doses a week. Uh, that means it will take several months for us to get completely through this group and we continue to ask for their, your patience. Everyone 65 and older who wants the vaccine will be able to do so, but those appointments will happen over the coming several months. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Elke. Great, thank you very much, <laughs> Director, and thank you all for participating in today's press briefing. I have four items that I want to share with you today. The first is to talk about the retail, the federal retail pharmacy program to address some questions that we've heard around large scale vaccination sites. 
a, a little bit of information on the new Janssen vaccine and to finally wrap up with a review of our COVID-19 vaccine advisory committee results. So I'll start with the federal retail pharmacy program. Um, you heard the director talk about the uh, retail, or excuse me, the, the federal pharmacy program that's related to long-term care facilities. So this is a second federal pharmacy program. Um, and this federal retail pharmacy program is different in that it allows for the state to designate chain pharmacies to participate in vaccine administration. Uh, the designated pharmacies register directly with the federal government and they receive an allocation of doses of vaccines in addition to the vaccines allocated to the state. So similar to the long-term care facility program, um, they're working directly with the federal government. However, in this case, the vaccines go directly to um, these retail pharmacies. So again, this is above and beyond the existing state allocation and is different than the long-term care pharmacy program. One million doses are committed to be distributed across the U.S. for this federal program, which equates to approximately 5,000 doses in Idaho. And the pro <clears throat> excuse me, the program is scheduled to begin this week with doses arriving in Idaho uh, Thursday the 11th. Again, the vaccine goes directly from the manufacturer to these pharmacies. And while Idaho does not allocate the doses, we are able to capture those doses administered as a result of this program. And those will be also shared on the um, transparency uh, data site that the director just reviewed. The state was allowed to select two chain pharmacies to, to begin with, and the state selected Albertsons and Walmart. Uh, Walgreens and CVS, as the director mentioned, are already were already participating in the long-term care facility program. Um, but as more retail pharmacies are um, able, as, as more doses are available, more retail pharmacies will be able to participate in this retail pharmacy program. So more to come on that in the future as we get more doses. Another um, area I wanted to cover, as I mentioned, was around uh, large-scale vaccination sites. And the reason why we wanted to address this is because we've received many inquiries about whether Idaho will be engaging in these max vac vaccination sites. They're also known as large-scale vaccination sites or high-throughput sites. So these events um, are intended for high volume vaccine administration over a condensed period of time. And I wanna point out that they're not like the type of high throughput event that we saw during H1N1, where there was a lineup of people signing up for the, or getting in line for their vaccines and it was all first come first serve. Uh, this is different because of course we have physical distancing um, requirements for these facilities. Uh, to keep people safe from potential exposures and these events for these large-scale events that you're seeing currently are by appointment only. Um, they're currently happening um, across the state with uh, at the local level now and they're being done in a variety of ways. Uh, some of the health districts are working with their partners to host events in places such as their fairgrounds or conference facilities. We've also seen private providers that are hosting these events at their hospitals for example. Um, one of the questions was around if the state would be potentially engaging in this type of event and the state could potentially be engaged in this type of event in the future using federal um, resources to help us that would be in support of local efforts um, or for large employers and this is all potentially. Um, but we haven't made any decisions yet at, uh, at this time due to limitations in the vaccine supply. Uh, currently there's not enough supply to, to have the state undertake this level for this type of event in addition to the local events. But as we see more opportunities, we definitely want to be able to partner with our, our locals and uh, making sure that we're uh, getting as much vaccine out as quickly and as efficiently and safely as possible. The next uh, item is around the new Janssen vaccine. So as I'm sure you're all familiar, Johnson & Johnson announced that its single shot Janssen COVID-19 vaccine has been submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for emergency use authorization. According to Johnson & Johnson, in recent studies in the U.S., Latin America, and South America, the vaccine was 72% effective in the U.S. participants and 66% effective overall at preventing moderate to severe COVID. It was shown to be 85% effective in preventing severe disease and provided 100% protection against COVID-related hospitalization and death. The vaccine does not have the same storage and handling requirements as the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, 
which allows for easier use in clinical settings, which is um, a, a nice um, opportunity for rural states especially. The company submitted for emergency use authorization and stated that it expects to supply approximately 100 million doses in the first half of the year, which uh, could mean a very welcome influx of vaccine into the state. Once the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, or VERB PAC, reviews and approves their emergency use authorization on the 26th of this month, it then gets reviewed by CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ASAP. As with the previous two vaccine, COVID vaccines that we have right now, this review will occur very soon after the FDA uh, review. And that means that if everything goes smoothly, we could see vaccine approval and distribution of this Johnson Johnson vaccine as soon as the first or second week of March into the state. The final thing that I wanted to review with you are the results from our COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, as a reminder, this committee, the um, call it CVAC, provides recommendations to the department and the governor on prioritizations of populations to be vaccinated when our vaccine supply is limited. So CVAC met last Friday, and I'm, I'm sure that many of you participated in that, um, in observing the, the, the committee make their deliberations. And on Friday when we met, we reevaluated re two votes from our January meeting and to vote on additional inputs to vaccine priority groups one and two. The votes were recommended to the governor, and as of yesterday, he approved all of those votes with a note of appreciation to the thoughtful deliberation of the CVAC members. Uh, there were two reevaluation votes that CVAC needed to take up. The first was for uh, related to adult family members who provide in-home personal care um, and to have them remain prioritized in group 1.2 under home care providers. And this did not pass, but it will be included in future uh, considerations. There's a lot of conversation uh, around the large size of this population group. It accounts for nearly 290,000 individuals potentially. Um, so they were very thoughtful in their deliberation on this group, and we will be taking them up um, for consideration in future groups. The second reconsideration vote that we took was a subset of gas, electric, water, and telecommunications utility workers who work indoors, and the request for that was for them to be prioritized in group 2.3 with other frontline essential workers. This vote did pass. Therefore, this group will be included in group 2.3 when it's time to move to that group. Um, currently, we're in 2.2, which is eight people aged 65 years of age and older. Then uh, finally, there were five other votes that were taken uh, in the time that we had available for the group. There were two that were general. Um, one of them was that uh, interpreters, uh, ASL and other, as well as other languages could be vaccinated within the sector and setting which with it, in which they work. Um, that vote passed. So interpreters um, will, will be vaccinated with the sector and setting in which they work. So for example, if there's an interpreter working in a hospital setting, they'll be vaccinated within the hospital group. If they are uh, in an education setting, they would be vaccinated with that group and so forth. The next overall vote was around construction workers to be uh, vaccinated in the sector for which they are doing the construction. And this, group, uh, this um, vote did not pass. Furthermore, there were three additional votes, all of which did not pass. Uh, one was for licensed massage therapists to be included in group 1.4, uh, along with physical therapists, as well as certified Pilates instructors. Uh, those two votes did not pass. And finally, um, immigration legal services, the request was to have them included in group 2.1 under relief services, um, for frontline essential workers, and that also did not pass. So there were many more votes that were scheduled to be undertaken by CVAC on Friday, but our time ran short. So these votes will be taken up by CVAC on an online poll before our next meeting, which is on February 19th, um, at which time the results of those votes will be shared back with CVAC members. And of course, as many of you know, that is also open to um, the media and to the public to observe those meetings. And most of those remaining votes that we didn't get to all pertain to groups 2.3, which is the remaining part of um, frontline essential workers. I do want to take a quick moment to note that we still 
have uh, to look forward to votes and considerations for Idaho Group 3, which is um, uh, in alignment with ACIP or CDC's group, or excuse me, Phase 1C. So there's a lot more that CVAC has to consider as we move forward um, making decisions around limited uh, dose availability. And so with that, I will end, and I just want to reiterate what the, both the director and the governor stated about the importance of people being patients uh, with regard to getting their vaccine. We're doing a fantastic job across the state getting those vaccines rolled out as quickly as possible. Um, we very much appreciate all of the work and effort of all of our vaccine providers in uh, doing their part. And we also uh, want to thank the public for their job and going and getting the vaccine and taking all those measures and continuing to be safe and wearing their masks and physically distance and proper hand hygiene and all the things that we keep saying. And with that, I will we can turn it over for questions. Okay, so we will now take uh, vaccine related questions from media participants. We will answer as many questions as possible in the time available. Please raise your hand in WebEx by selecting the hand icon in the lower right portion of your screen. You can also type your question into the chat area, which you can access in the lower right part of your screen. When I say your name, please unmute yourself and announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. So it looks like first up is Audrey Dutton. Go ahead, Audrey. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I am curious about the first and second doses, and I, I have kind of a couple of questions. Um, are you seeing that, you know, what proportion of people are getting their second dose on time and getting it at all? Um, are we at 100% or is it 90 or, you know, what what's going on there? And also, um, how much of what's coming into the state now is second doses versus first doses. Thanks, Audrey. And I'm playing question fielder here. So, uh, Director, those were all included in the presentation that you gave. If you wanted to reiterate some of those numbers and perhaps you can share your screen again if, that, if need be. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for the question. Um, yes, yeah, so we actually um, weren't able to get this onto the website just yet, but we are looking closely at. Uh, for individuals that should be getting their second dose, are we seeing them get their second dose and are they doing that on time? Um, and I don't have a percentage off the top of my head, but it is very high in the high 90% uh, of individuals that are both getting their second dose and doing that on time. Uh, and so, as I said in my uh, opening comments, the vast, vast majority, high 90% uh, of individuals are doing exactly what we would expect, which is getting their second dose and doing so on time. Um, and then uh, I think you had a, a first question, which was, which I'm now blanking on. Would you mind repeating that, Audrey? Sure. Uh, and thanks for answering the, the with the 90%, um, high 90%. So how much of what of the doses that we're getting in now have to go to second doses versus our first doses? Are we still at about 25,000-ish for first doses as well as second doses coming in or or what? Uh, Audrey, great question. Yes, yeah, so uh, first doses is running right at about 25,000, and it's, it's in that range. It fluctuates up and down a few hundred thousand uh, each week here the last couple of weeks. Uh, second doses, as you know, they come about a week early, and they're based on, um, uh, on when somebody got their first dose. Uh, and as you will recall, uh, Pfizer is three weeks later and Moderna is four weeks later. Uh, and we're seeing those, um, you know, come in on time. And and that brings our total number up. I'd have to defer to maybe Sarah Lee to see if we have a total number, uh, but we're but it's, it sort of trails, right? So a few weeks ago, we were getting about 20,000 doses a week. So now we're getting about 25,000 first doses, and now we're getting those 20,000 second doses that occurred three to four weeks ago. Uh, so generally what we're seeing right now in the state is about of total doses coming in, uh, kind of in that, um, that 45,000 each range. Uh, in a few weeks, we'll see the second doses bump up to 25,000 because that's what we're giving in first doses this this week, for example, and that kind of stair steps in that way. But in general, we're seeing about 45,000 doses a week come in, about 25,000 first, and then about 20,000 second. So you aren't seeing healthcare providers having to kind of cannibalize their second doses to use for first or vice versa? 
That is correct. Uh, the federal uh, system has been very reliable, 100% reliable about allocating and sending those second doses when they are due. Uh, and so we have not had any um, any provider that needs to cannibalize their second, their uh, first doses to do second doses that are said differently, the, the right number of doses for first and second doses are coming into the state and have been consistently. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, and sorry if I don't pronounce this right, but Chase uh, Byfelt. Yeah, that's close enough, Zach. Uh, it's actually Byfelt, but who cares? Okay. Um, so uh, my question is, we, we have a couple of viewer questions. Um, I don't know how many of them we can get answered, but um, I'll start with, with one that's pretty specific. So we had a viewer reach out to us to ask, will Idaho change to allow people with two comorbidities to get the vaccine no matter their age? Um, thanks, Chase, for that question. That is, um, as I mentioned earlier, our COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee uh, has a lot more um, decisions and sometimes hard decisions that they need to make in prioritization. So for we're currently working in group two. The next group that we need to look at is group three, as I mentioned. Uh, that group is really focused on the other essential workers because currently we're working in frontline essential workers. And the other group that we need to take into consideration are people aged 16 to 64 with medical conditions that put them at high risk of COVID-19. Um, so those are our upcoming votes that we need to take. And we know that some states are, uh, are you know, every state's doing things a little bit differently and some are prioritizing things a bit differently. So um, stay tuned, I guess would be the, the answer to that shortly. Okay. Uh Thank you for that. I, I'm just going to sneak another one in right quick while I'm while I'm still up. Uh, our, another question is: um, Is Idaho looking at what other states are doing and thinking about any new approaches based on that research? Um, specific to vaccine and prioritization, I'm assuming you're you're meaning. And uh, yes, of course, we've been uh, clearly sticking at this particular point in time with the CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommendations. Um, our vaccine advisory committee has really focused on adopting those and of course we evaluate those. We They have made some um, changes compared to what ACIP and CDC recommended. For example, uh, we lowered the age to age 65 and older. Um, they had CDC had recommended 75 and older for vaccination. So they take all of that into consideration very carefully. Um, but always, of course, if we learn something new from a different state, we'll take that into consideration as well. Okay. Uh, next question. I'm seeing Joe Paris. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks so much. Um, We've had uh, a lot of questions into our newsroom about uh, the prep mod tool, which we understand now uh, doesn't quite align with Idaho's goals, if, if I understood that correctly. Um, one thing, though, that uh, feedback we had heard is people were excited for the tool and now are unsure uh, what to do. I know that there's been guidance to go to the state's coronavirus webpage, um, but I'm curious, what message do you have for Idahoans that tell us that they're having a hard time figuring out where to get a vaccine and how to get in touch with a medical provider. I know many people are going to their traditional healthcare provider, St. Luke, St. Alphonsus, uh, but for those that aren't really aware of how to navigate that, what's the guidance right now? Great, thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll start and I can definitely toss it over to, to Sarah and others to add. Um, as we've talked about in several of these, media briefings. We originally were looking at PrepMod as a potential tool for statewide scheduling and, and um, uh, to registration opportunity, if you will. And while we were looking at that, uh, the, the local public health districts and local providers were also standing up their own tools. So what we've done, and I think it was the last time we had this last week, I reviewed the new information that we have on our coronavirus site. There's a new you know button that's on there that says where and when can I get vaccinated and if you go to that we do provide those links to the local public health districts and their uh, toll-free numbers where people the public can go to ask questions about how to get uh, registered um, that said we're always looking for for ways that we can do a better job of providing um, opportunities for people to learn when and where to get vaccinated and um, so I would you know, 
we'll keep looking at tools as they become available um, and see if there's something that we can potentially stand up over time. But for now, we didn't want there to be then eight different ways of folks getting on lists and trying to find vac um, vaccine locations. So we're directing them to their local public health districts. And in terms of uh, familiarity uh, with the system, just so we can kind of explain people how this works, is it kind of like a call center is set up at each public health district and they kind of just push from there? That is correct. When you go to the um, the site, you can, on our site, you can see uh, there's a, a table in there and it has a, a essentially a, a hotline or a call center for each of the health districts or a web link that they can go to. Great. There and I are. just had uh, one quick follow-up question. Uh, during the AARP town hall last week, Governor Little had touched on briefly that he had been in touch with the Biden administration about a possible increase in vaccines, uh, the weekly allotment, those first doses. I believe he said something in the neighborhood of 27,000. Um, at the time, he said it, it wasn't for sure, it wasn't definite, but I'm curious if there is an update on that. Um, not having been on that, I would see if the director has anything to add uh, for context on the response. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you for the question, Joe. So um, if you recall, we had been at about 20,000 doses. Uh, we have seen that increase to about 25,000. This week, I think it was 25,500 doses. Um, uh, uh, that have come in over the last two weeks, um, and that's an increase uh, from what we had been seeing previously. Uh, the Biden administration uh, has, has signaled that that may increase as we go forward, but there's been, as far as I know, unless Elke or Sarah have more recent information, no commitment on what that amount may be. Uh, but I do know they're working uh, pretty, pretty uh, focused on how do we, how do they increase the supply. Uh, the one additional thing is what Elke mentioned in her comments. Uh, is the, the federal retail pharmacy partnership that will be taking place with Walmart and um, uh, and with uh, uh, Albert and Savon. Thank you, Elke. Uh, and that actually gave us another 5% um, increase or 5,000 doses, if I remember that correctly. Elke, did I get that right? Yep, 5,000. So that would, be on, that would be on top of the 25,000 we're already getting. Okay. Next question is for Kyle Fonnensteel. Thanks, and good job pronouncing it. Um, I, I have a question about the new state tool that, that rolled out yesterday. Th there's a few vaccine providers who are reporting 0% of doses being administered. Uh, I, I was told by one facility that it was just an issue with them getting into IRIS, and that some of their doses were actually transferred to another sister facility. I, I'm wondering, um, you know, how widespread are, are these issues with accessing and reporting into the IRIS system? And also, what kind of reporting like this was happening before, where were providers regularly telling the state what their vaccine inventory was? Thanks, Kyle. And um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a stab at that and then, of course, have the director <laughs> it out. Um, so, yeah, there are, we, we were, of course, with our immunization uh, system or IRIS, there's always been a requirement for vaccine providers to provide their data into the system. And that's how we track the number of doses. Um, these are a lot of new providers that have never you know, worked with the IRIS before. And so as they were learning um, how to work with the system over time, you know, things have gotten better and better. Uh, definitely, um, there are some providers that you'll see, and I think, I don't know if director, you want to take this about having zero doses that are administered. Uh, they might, there could be A, reporting that will just take some time to get caught up, and B, yes, being a new provider, they might have gotten an allocation of doses through the local public health district, um, and it's just taking a little bit of time for them to catch up um, and get those doses administered, but I'll let the director continue on with that. Yeah, thank you, Elke, and thank you, Kyle, for the question. Um, I agree with what Elke said, that this is not new information. We've had this uh, in IRIS all along. We just obviously took a little bit of work to get it formatted and out onto the website here. Um, I will say that going through that process, particularly with providers that were new to IRIS, um, has accelerated uh, the need to solve any reporting issues that they have. And so the only thing that I would add is, uh, we're very committed, and as, as are the providers, to make sure that there are no reporting issues with getting data into IRIS. I, I only know of a handful where there's still some outstanding 
uh, issues being worked through to make sure that their data comes into IRIS uh, accurately and correctly. Uh, for those that have not been able to get into IRIS, several are just sending us that data via an, an alternate channel, sometimes even just as an email, until we get that resolved so that the data can be as accurate as it, as it is. Um, we are expecting, and that's why we're holding what we're calling office hours and, and an email box. Uh, for anybody that's, any of those providers that are having issues, we want to help them get that corrected. We'll do whatever it takes to get that corrected uh, so that the data is both accurate and easy for everybody to use the providers to get the data to us, et cetera. Um, so we're not seeing widespread issues with providers uh, getting data into IRIS. There are a handful, uh, and we continue to work through those to make sure that we get the, the data accurately, timely, and through the system. And, and Director, if I may add, there may be situations too when you see it on the, the website that will you'll see changes over time where you might see that they've been administered, excuse me, they might have been distributed doses and they haven't administered any yet, um, which maybe by the next time it's updated, you'll see that that's not the case. They might have been planning for an event that they're having. And so that'll be the important thing to watch this just sort of over time um, and see you can see more of the patterns of administration. Um, and then the last thing I would just say to that question, Kyle, is um, uh, that the only providers that we've listed on the website are those that have been allocated doses. So there are providers in the state that are enrolled that have not, because of supply, have not been allocated doses yet. Uh, so the only ones that you'll see on the website are those that have actually been allocated doses. Thank you. And if you have time for a quick follow-up, uh, in, in my health district, Eastern Idaho Public Health, uh, they've moved to a lottery sign-up system for seniors after phone lines and online registration form were overwhelmed last week. Uh, I'm wondering if, if the state is providing any more guidance to local public health districts or individual providers on ways to equitably let, um, let seniors sign up for vaccines. Yeah, Kyle, we're, we work with the health districts, as I mentioned in many of these previous um, briefings, we work with the health districts daily. Um, I can let Sarah talk about, you know, the types of conversations that they have on a weekly basis, continually trying to problem solve. Um, and I think, you know, you'll see some of the health districts are trying their, their best to provide some novel solutions to make sure that they're getting people in as quickly as possible and trying to kind of pivot in the moment to, to make sure that they can get their vaccine out as equitably as possible. And Sarah, do you have any comments you'd like to add about your interactions with the districts? Sure, uh, our staff, vaccine management staff are talking weekly with, with each, each public health district staff as they work to try to be fair, as fair as possible to allocate uh, the distribution we have for each health district across all the providers, you know, and sometimes um, providers that had been getting a lot more doses because there may have been not as many providers in their region are now getting fewer doses, but um, in an effort to try to distribute, um, you know, across all regions in the state, um, that's, that's, that's kind of an unintended consequence right now, but, and, and hopefully that'll, that will stop happening as we get more and more doses in, but um, our staff, our staff are in weekly conversations with the health districts multiple times a week, um, discussing how to support how we can support their decisions to distribute doses to providers in their region. Okay. Uh, for the next question, we have Nicole Camarda. Hi, um, I'm Nicole with Idaho News 6. Um, my question's for Elkie. It's probably similar to um, one of the other questions you already answered, but We've been getting a lot of questions about Idaho inmates, um, and I want to know if there's any talk among the CVAC um, group about when and how Idaho inmates would be vaccinated, where they might be on the list, um, and if they could be placed before the general public or not. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, there have been some preliminary conversations with CVAC about um, vaccinating inmates, and I think like I said, there, there's so many more, there's, we've only made it through the first part of group two. So there's a lot more conversation to be had. Um, and we know that we've also received comments about, um, or input, I should say, that needs to be taken back to, excuse me, <coughs> uh, that needs to be taken back to CVAC. We are, you know, because inmates 
are also people who are age 65 and older or have long-term care um, type environment in which they're living. Those inmates do get do receive vaccine because they're part of those population groups. Um, but as a general kind of go in and vaccinate the entire population, we have not gotten to that stage yet with the conversations with CVAC. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next uh, we have Melissa Davlin. Hi, this is Melissa Davlin with Idaho Reports. I was wondering how far ahead the state is looking um, when it comes to getting ready to vaccinate children. I understand that we are a ways out and obviously there are no vaccines approved for anyone younger than 16 right now, but we will get there eventually. Has the state started those conversations on how to administer so many school age children? That's a, a good question, Melissa. Um, I would say that since we currently don't have, I'll let Dr. Hahn weigh in on this too, um, because I know that there've also been, of course, national conversations as well in which she might've participated. Um, of course, we're, we're always trying to look ahead at what population groups um, are coming up and how we can best serve them. And uh, given that there isn't a vaccine, as you mentioned, um, uh, approved for for children at this particular point in time, um, we certainly you know need to start having those conversations and what that might look like. But I I would let Dr. Hahn weigh in on uh, any further details. Yeah, thank you, Elke. So, um, you know, as a parent myself, I'm very eager to see this happen, and I think we all are. Um, but as Elke mentioned, the trials are going slower than expected. There are trials um, ongoing for as young as 12. Um, but I actually just read a story in the Washington Post today, um, and they did inter they interviewed folks at Pfizer, Moderna, um, AstraZeneca, Janssen, you know, and, and talked to uh, in, uh, folks at Stanford about the progress. And they're basically saying that it's going to be maybe longer than we'd like to think. Um, one one um, Pfizer investigator said it would probably be another year uh, before young children will have uh, will have all the safety data we need. Uh, obviously, that's just one person's opinion. You know that things have gone faster than we expected in other areas. I hope. I hope. He's wrong. I hope it's a little sooner than that, but it is a ways down the road. That said, um, I'm actually just re reviewing all that information right now. I'll be talking to the Head Start tomorrow. They have a conference going on right now. We are trying to start communicating to groups that serve children and just talking about, first of all, um, the severity that can occur in kids. Most people are well aware that kids don't tend to get as sick as adults do, but nonetheless, just making sure the awareness is there that they can get sick and also talking about the eventuality of a vaccine for children. But as Elke said, it, it is a ways away. And I think really from reading that story again, just today, um, it, I realized that I, I think we need to start changing expectations about how quickly a vaccine might be available for younger children. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question we have is coming from the chat. This is Karen Bosick with Ion Sun Valley, and she's asking, is it possible to include on your dashboard how many doses each provider is getting as soon as it is determined so people can look at it and say, hey, my hospital is getting 150 doses this week, so maybe I have a chance to snag one. Um, yeah, we, the, the, enrolled providers get their, um, it's on a weekly allocation. So, I, last week, I reviewed the whole process for um, allocation, distribution, and administration, and you'll only see on the website that number being updated once a week. So each of those providers, that's based on a weekly allocation that they get, and that's part of a conversation that they have with their local public health districts. So, Director, you look like you wanted to add something to that. Um, no, I was just going to say what you said, so I won't repeat that. And uh, we'll, uh, we will continue to evolve this website for both providers and for tracking people. Uh, and we'll look to continue to add information that's helpful both to the public and to the providers to make sure that they have the best information about where doses are. So we'll uh, take that suggestion under advisement. But as Elke said, uh, those uh, doses allocated will only change once a week because that's how often those decisions are made. So you can watch for that as well. <coughs> 
Okay, uh, next I want to make sure that uh, those with your hands up are still intending to ask a question. Um, but next we have Audrey Dutton. Did you have another question? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, what is the progress on getting race and demographic data? Uh, where does that stand? When do you expect to have that? Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Audrey. I'm actually going to turn that over to either Dr. Hahn or Sarah Leeds because they have an update. I'm not sure who wants to take it. Yeah, Sarah, if you want to, I think it's good news, so a good chance to. <laughs> <laughs> it is good news. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I just got an update from our um, IIS, um, our IRIS vendor uh, yesterday, and that that capacity will be ready um, from their end on Thursday evening, and so we will have an overnight um, up update to IRIS, and then the messaging, the a, a patient's record coming into uh, Iris from now on will have that data if it's in the patient's health record. So while race and ethnicity is not a mandated collection data piece in Iris, it will now have a landing spot if it's in the patient's record. And so we will be able to begin populating data with, with that. So it's good news. It won't be comprehensive, but it's a start for us and we'll keep moving on from there. So we'll start uh, really being able to collect on Friday then, since it'll be the overnight Thursday? We should have data by Friday, uh, the weekend at least. Okay. I have to think about through when we get Friday's data, it's Thursday's vaccine data. So it'll probably Any be Saturday if it's in okay. there. Mm -hmm. Is anything um, going to be added beyond race and ethnicity to IRIS? At this point, we don't have plans to add more data pieces, but um, as we kind of get our feet under us as this COVID vaccine effort goes forward, we will just we will certainly consider those. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next, uh, Joe Paris again. Um, I had a quick question about uh, the amount of providers. I saw that the Department of Health and Welfare published yesterday that there were 399 vaccine providers currently and 49 more in the process of being approved. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on with the limited amount of vaccine, if that spreads the supply too thin with more and more providers, or if this is designed just to create more options in more locations. Um, Joe, I look at it as if you, I mean, there are kind of two prongs to, uh, in my mind about getting the vaccine out. One is about, uh, first off, safety of the vaccine, making sure it's being handled and stored properly is paramount, but making sure that we're getting it out as quickly as possible, but also as equitably as possible. And so having a wide variety of enrolled providers, I think, is very valuable because then we have opportunities to get vaccines to the places where people are. Um, we know that not everybody can come to a, a large high throughput event um, in an urban area, and we need to be able to take some of those vaccines out to local areas. Um, just even heard of a success story um, that was in the, the newspaper in McCall of um, Cascade Medical Center working with the town of Yellow Pine to take vaccines to their locations. And so to their to their town and do those um, vaccines there. So I think there that having a variety really gives us a lot of options. As Sarah had mentioned, you know, as the health districts are working with those enrolled providers, um, you know, they're having to make those decisions every week on who gets vaccine and who doesn't for the week, depending upon what events and what um, measures are taking to get vaccines out. As we get more course, we'll have more opportunity, more vaccine, we'll have more opportunities through all the enrolled providers. Okay, and what appears to be our last question, at least for the time being, uh, Chase, go ahead. Hey, um, sorry. So I don't know who uh, might be able to answer this question because it's not um, directly um, vaccine related. It's more on uh, the positivity rate. Um, but we had a viewer ask, is 5% positivity rate still a goal? And what happens if we reach that? 
Um, this is Chris. I'm happy to try to take the health geek. Yeah, like. yeah, first of all, um, 5%, you know, was um, what was really talked about in a lot of the national recommendations about that's a target that would help us indicate that our community spread was low and our testing was adequate. So it is a helpful kind of measure or metric. Uh, but if we get there, it doesn't mean we stop, we let up, we keep on um, because, of course, we'd like to get to the point where we have zero or close to zero positivity. Um, uh, so it, it won't change anything in, in a way, if just that number on its own, but taken together with some of the other things we're seeing, like decreasing case counts, decreasing hospitalizations, all those information, all that information together uh, will help us decide whether it's time to uh, change some of our mitigation measures that are in place. But on its own, just reaching that number, we will probably, um, you know, pop some, you know, LaCroix here in celebration. But um, other than that, there's there's not much that's going to change just because of that number. Hey, thank you. LaCroix are good. <laughs> okay, we're down to our last three minutes here. Um, Audrey, did you have another question? I do. We'll see if you can answer it this, in three minutes. What uh, what work is the state doing to prevent vaccine hesitancy? Um, get ahead of that. There certainly are large forces um, kind of pushing the idea that the vaccine is dangerous and, you know, people sharing, uh, you know, I had an allergic reaction and things like that. So what what are you all doing? Yeah, um, thanks for that. Uh, the director and Dr. Han and I, as well as some others on the this briefing are all participating in some communications efforts with the governor's office and have employed um, a consulting firm and a media consulting firm to help uh, create some of those messages to help address vaccine hesitancy. And um, I will turn this over to the director and, and Dr. Han. I've only been, I had to leave our most recent call early, so I didn't hear the final Kind of time frame on when some of those messaging uh, messages are going to be rolled out. Director, well, uh, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, so, and then I'll have Dr. Han end for me here. Uh, but yes, we we are sending messages now um, about uh, vaccine and vaccine hesitancy through uh, our social media channels um, and through these these press events as well as uh, just communication that we do in general. Uh, but we ha have, as Melky said, engaged a firm to help us do really research to understand what uh, the drivers of vaccine hesitancy are and um, how we can message to the public to help them make an informed decision as they consider taking the vaccine. Uh, we expect somewhere probably in April or May for that type of messaging to be out in the market that's very specific. Uh, right now, we have many, many, many hundreds of thousands of people that want the vaccine. Uh, and we'll, 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 we, uh, we'll start shifting to some of that very specific messaging in April or May. Uh, having said that, uh, one of the big things that's come out of that research is really uh, for many people that are vaccine hesitant with this vaccine, it's about really understanding uh, what are the side effects and what are the safety, uh, uh, safety pr um, uh, procedures that were followed in the clinical trials. Uh, and there, you know, we, 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 there are side effects, but they are very relatively minor. I won't go through them here. Uh, and there have been many tens of thousands and now hundreds of thousands uh, of people in the country that have taken the vaccine. Um, and there have been some adverse reactions, such as allergic reactions, but the vast, vast, vast majority of people have not had that. Uh, and, uh, and there always are some side effects with vaccines, but there's nothing really out of the normal with this one that's, that's come around. Uh, but Dr. Han, I would just hand that over to you to finish that up. Yeah, Director, absolutely. I think you you um, summarized our conversation really well. We're aware, of course, Idaho has a high rate of vaccine hesitancy, and uh, we do need to be, uh, I think, the efforts of the governor's office and the department to try to be as transparent as possible, um, our efforts to try to communicate as much as possible, and I think time are going to be extremely helpful. I think, you know, we, we one thing we've learned from some of the, the work that's been done is that some people are sort of taking that wait and see attitude. <laughs> you know, let's, let's make sure other people get the vaccine, that they come out looking okay. And I think as more and more people hopefully say, hey, I got the shot and yeah, my arm was sore, but it wasn't too bad. Uh, hopefully more and more people will have the confidence to step up and get, get vaccinated. Okay, we're out of time for today, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we're planning another media briefing about COVID-19 vaccine 
in Idaho at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Tuesday, February 16th. Watch out for those details on Monday. And thank you everyone for joining us.